Um, my name is Emily Lakdawalla. I am the senior editor and planetary evangelist for the Planetary Society, the world's largest space interest organization. For me, the most thrilling moments in solar system exploration are when places that were formerly points of light turn into, into places with geology that we can imagine exploring. It's an incredibly exciting time for all of us to be alive and see the first glimpses of the landscapes on these formerly unexplored worlds. We have a star-studded panel for you today, so I'm gonna get straight to them. Um, first up on our panel is going to be Alan Stern, who is principal investigator for the New Horizons mission to Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. He is also associate vice president at Southwest Research Institute. Next, we'll have Claudia Alexander, who is the project scientist for the United States contribution to the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission to Comet churyumov gerasimenko And she's also a research scientist at JPL. We have Dante Loretta, principal investigator for the OSIRIS-REx mission to return a sample from asteroid Bennu. He's also a professor at the University of Arizona. And last but not least, we have Carol Raymond, who is deputy principal investigator for the Dawn mission to both Vesta and Ceres, and principal scientist at JPL. But first, it's my honor to introduce Jim Green, who is director of planetary science at NASA headquarters, to say a few words about this exciting moment in planetary exploration. Thank you very much, Emily. You know, NASA has planetary spacecraft that have flown through the solar system. We've, we have, over the last 50 years, have taken the approach of flyby, orbit, land, rove, and return samples to some of the most exciting places you can imagine. In fact, today, we are here to celebrate some of those new objects that we're going to visit. These objects are the smaller ones. We know of the larger planets, and we've been to many of those. Uh, we've landed, we've roved, we've brought back samples. But indeed, the smaller objects are incredibly important to us. There's well over a million of these. What kinds are they? Well, they are different kinds. They're small planets. They're asteroids. They're comets. But they have one major thing in common. They have H2O, they have water in some form. And understanding these small bodies is extremely important in understanding the origin and evolution of the solar system. One of the planetary scientists that do a lot of modeling for us expresses it this way. You know, a lot of crimes are, are, are solved by the blood spatters, by those small bits and pieces that are out there. Now, our solar system has evolved from a huge collapsing cloud of material well over four and a half billion years ago. And we are in locations in the solar system that have been pushed around by our giant planets as we've uncovered these kind of dynamics. So what role did these bodies play in that origin and in that, in that evolution? What's going to happen next? We need to study these bodies. We need to study the solar system. We know that Venus is incredibly hot, hot enough to melt lead on its surface. We know that Mars, which is further from the sun, is colder. It's almost a desert world, although it has a significant amount of water underneath its surface. What happened on Venus could happen on Earth. What's happened at Mars could happen on Earth. If we spin, we evolve and our solar system is evolving. We, know, we need to know what role these small bodies have played in getting life here, and believe you me, we are well on the track, I believe, of understanding that life may exist beyond Earth. These are exciting times, and so without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Alan Stern, the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission going to the Pluto system. Alan. Okay, can I get my first slide up, or do I advance it myself? Oh, there we go, great. Hi, everybody. Well, I'm gonna try and give you a quick overview of New Horizons, what the mission is about, in five minutes. This is a project that's been going on now for 15 years. Uh, 2,500 Americans have been involved, and so rather than just speed it up like an old-style 78 record, I'm just gonna give you some of the top details, and then we can talk about it more on the panel. 
This is our route of flight. We launched in January of 2006 on a three billion mile, nine and a half year journey uh, across the solar system to the very frontier, to the farthest places that humans have ever explored, to the Pluto system and the Kuiper belt. And our route of flight is shown there in red. The Kuiper belt, like the asteroid belt that Mark Raymond talked about, um, is a vast expanse. In fact, the Kuiper belt has more surface area than all the space out to Neptune by a factor of three. This is a huge new element in the architecture of the solar system. We call it the third zone. After the terrestrial planets and after the giant planets is the Kuiper belt, the largest architectural element in our planetary system. That's backwards. There's forwards. Yeah, this is a mission that the scientific community has wanted for a very long time. Studies of Pluto missions began around 1980 and continued all the way through 2001 when New Horizons won a competition and was selected to be built and launched. And in fact, the reason that this mission actually was built and launched is because the National Academy of Sciences ranked the exploration of Pluto and the Kuiper Belt at the very top of what's called the Decadal Survey, which is the priority list. And that, as a result, uh, unleashed the funding to get this done. And this is really a cool mission. I have to tell you, it's sort of a mission like we used to fly in NASA in the 60s and 70s all the time, going to a brand new place like Dawn is, going to the very frontier. This is the fastest spacecraft ever launched. And yet, despite that, it's taken us a long time, nine and a half years. It's not that we're dawdling, it's that we're going a very long way. It's hard to picture the expanse of space in our solar system. So if you think of it as dawn traveling, and I mean dawn, traveling not, not through space, but say down your street, its location, orbiting Ceres, would be like, let's say, instead of three astronomical units away, the third house down the street. Pluto, by contrast, is 32 houses down the street. It's a very long way that this mission has traveled. Um, this is the first mission in a new series called New Frontiers. Um, you'll hear a little bit later from Dante Loretta, who's the principal investigator of the third mission in that series. But what I want to tell you first about is our spacecraft. Unlike Dawn, which is very large, this is a small, compact spacecraft. In fact, if you see this inset, you can see pic pictures of people next to it. It only weighs about 1,000 pounds. And it's so small that it's about the size of a baby grand piano. Everything from guidance systems to command and data handling to the propulsion system and all the scientific instruments are inside or on that 1,000-pound spacecraft. In fact, that weight even includes the fuel. And this spacecraft carries seven very sophisticated cameras, spectrometers, plasma instruments, the first student-built instrument to fly on a planetary mission. It actually contains the most sophisticated and powerful set of instruments ever brought to bear on the first reconnaissance of a new planet. And we're going to give you quite a ride in just a couple of months at the Pluto system. I think I'm going to just talk about the objectives. There are a lot of words in this chart. Today we know very little about the Pluto system, but by the end of this flyby, we will have collected mapping data sets for geology, for composition, composition maps, thermal maps, stereo maps to reconstruct the topography. We will sample Pluto's atmosphere. We will determine the atmospheric composition, the escape rate, the vertical structure of temperature and pressure through the atmosphere. We'll search for new moons. We'll look for rings, and we'll do more than just that. But I think you get the idea, it's quite a list. In fact, this spacecraft and its instruments are so capable that we're gonna take about 100 times as much data when we're at Pluto in July than we can send back in any given day. And that's how effective New Horizons is gonna be. But as a result, it will take us a long time to send all the imagery and all the other data sets back. So you'll be seeing new data from New Horizons, not just in June and July as we approach and fly by Pluto, but you'll be seeing it for the next 16 months as if it was still there orbiting, which it's not. It's gonna go on out into the Kuiper Belt after this flyby. But the data sets will keep spooling back to Earth, radioed from the spacecraft to the deep space network that NASA runs throughout the rest of 2015 and most of 2016. Now, this is a little movie of the Pluto system made by New Horizons beginning last July. You can see Pluto in the center. It got a little bigger there because this is the sequence we took in January. That moon that's orbiting is called Charon. It's about twice the size of Ceres. 
And then you can see an, a further view of it taken just last month. These are the first images that actually re, uh, reveal features on the surface. And take a look at this inset. Now this is still back in July when we were 300 million miles away. And it jumps to January. We're about twice as close. You can start to see Pluto's almost becoming a real object. By April, you can see surface features. And that bright one that persists here at this position, that's a polar cap, we think. That's where Pluto's pole is. Pluto's tipped on its side. And that persistent bright spot at the, the northern pole is very suspicious. When we get closer, we'll be able to determine its composition. But it's interesting that we, we go so far from home and find what the first thing we find is a polar cap, something very familiar. Well, this is the, about the resolution of the best images that we've ever taken of Pluto. You can tell. You can't tell very much. This is a mission, as I said, of raw exploration in which we're going to turn a world like this into a completely mapped body. And our very best imagery that we'll be taking will be about 70 meters per pixel. We could, if we flew over Los Angeles at the same altitude, pick out the buildings on the Caltech campus where we are. And this is another way to illustrate that. This is a picture of Earth at the resolution that we will have for Pluto by mid-July. And the very best images, this is an inset picture taken of New York City at New Horizons' best resolution. That's Manhattan. That's Central Park. If you look carefully, you can count the ponds in Central Park. You can count the wharfs on the Hudson. If we make any discoveries like that, I'm going first to Jim. <laughs> but we'll tell you about it. Uh, I don't expect to do that, but I do expect for us to really reveal the Pluto system and the small planets of the Kuiper Belt um, for all of you and for everyone else, and very soon, and we can't wait. And I think with that, I'm going to invite Claudia Alexander from the Rosetta mission, my colleague and my friend, to come up and tell you about that spectacular mission as well. All right, everybody. Well, I want you to know that there's an Alice instrument on Rosetta, too. OK, that's why Alan is uh, one of my colleagues from Rosetta. There's also, um, there's no Ralph, though. I, I, did you see that there was Ralph and there was Alice on, uh, on New Horizons? Uh, OK, so this is uh, approximately what we'll be doing with Rosetta. We will be on doing things at the same time as New Horizons and Dawn at Ceres. So don't forget about us. We will be doing our perihelion. You see the red stuff there. It's kind of a slanted orbit that we're going around. The comet will be developing, developing its big tail. It will become active, which it kind of already has the past month. And that's caused us a little bit of problems because uh, we started getting a lot of dust. And suddenly, we couldn't see our, our familiar markers in the sky. And so we have to figure out uh, a new way to fly around this now becoming active comet. And it will be at its most active just past the New Horizons encounter. And um, we will, we hope to be able to wake up the lander and uh, continue to do uh, some experiments with the lander. And then we don't finish until July of 2016. So we keep going and um, we are really making a lot of very exciting um, ex discoveries with this wonderful mission. Uh, so here is one of the latest uh, cool pictures of our target. Uh, it looks a little bit like a rubber duck to everyone's surprise when we first uh, picked it out. To me, it looks more like the, um, the boot from the Monopoly game, you know, with the foot section and the leg section. Uh, but what's pretty clear is that uh, sensors are telling us that the whole comet is active. But to your eye, it looks like some, there's some very strict uh, beams coming out, or we sometimes call them jets, but now we don't know what to call them. Uh, and so we are actually looking at maybe flying through one of these, if we can figure out how to navigate. Uh, but we really want to learn how does this kind of an object in space work to generate these, uh, these fabulous uh, plumes or, or uh, uh, jets or whatever we want to eventually decide what they are, and how that then goes on to, to form the tail. Let's see, this is, if I can, it's a little movie uh, that shows us what we have to do now in terms of being in orbit 
Yes, thank you very much. So um, when, we, when the comet starts to become active, we no longer are able to go around and around in circles around it. And when we recently had a little bit of problem when the dust bubbled up in our, right in front of our field of view, uh, they, they went back to something they did when they did orbit, what we call orbit insertion, which is that they went back to these triangular orbits. Can you believe that? We have these new fangled uh, ways of doing a trajectory now, square orbits, uh, hover and swoop kind of orbits. But we are now triangulating our way around the, uh, the comet. And you can see in this uh, diagram, you, you see the little uh, very faint coma. And now that it's uh, really uh, starting to come to life, we have to figure out a little bit better how we're going to navigate around this. It's a little bit about like about that, uh, uh, that volcano in Iceland that when it goes off, the commercial pilots say, I'm flying in there. This flight is canceled. Or this flight has to be diverted all the way around and add several hours to your flight. It's this intermittent nature of the, of the atmosphere and the drag that it puts on the solar panels that causes problems with navigation. But it's also a great opportunity to learn some wonderful new things about how to fly uh, around an object in space. So let's see, what else did I put on this? Ah, OK. So some of the cool results that we have anticipated for a long time. This is a drawing that a friend of mine, a uh, colleague, uh, put together showing the early bombardment of the Earth. And I think it's kind of cute because there's this Hudson Bay looking big crater with the North American looking uh, continent like thing, uh, which is, of course, way too early for to have a North and South America back in the early days of the Earth. But the idea has been that comets brought water to the Earth. And in this, photo, this drawing, we have these beautiful craters filled with water, and the idea is that comets hydrated uh, 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 the upper mantle with bringing, bringing the water. But one of our first results, oh, OK, well, I'm gonna, let me go back and just say that one of our first results is that the comet that we are uh, exploring doesn't have anything like the flavor of Earth's water. So it was a big surprise, and it sends our scientists like me back to the drawing board to try to figure out, well, I guess there goes that idea. Um, and we really are trying to figure out where did Earth and all of its enormously hydrated upper mantle, uh, how did that come from uh, if Earth was formed in a place that was technically dry? So I want to say one more thing before I go on to the other stuff. People always ask me, what is the comet made of? And of course, that's one of the reasons why we're there. And so I, I bought these. OK, so this, if you can see, this green stuff, this is what the Earth is made out of, OK? It's called olivine. And it's one of the principal minerals in the, in the, uh, inside the Earth. It's beautiful. Uh, you can make a ring out of it uh, with a green stone called epidote. Um, I'll just, I'll just brag, y'all, and show my diamonds, OK? This is carbon. So this is another uh, uh, kind of mineral that is found uh, on the Earth. And this dark stuff, it's so much darker, OK? It's called enstatite. And many asteroids are made principally of uh, silicon mil minerals like this. So Earth also has enstatite, but Earth has more of this green stuff and uh, we are going to a comet and also other asteroids because we're trying to figure out, as the Earth was forming and all this other stuff, how do, how do you get stuff like enstatite as opposed to stuff like olivine? And how can we learn, putting the pieces of the puzzle together, what that stuff uh, originally came from? So here's an example that uh, Rosetta was sent to gather some of this material that may represent the earliest uh, material that out of which the solar system objects were formed. And I think it's cute because they just named, have named everything, right? They, uh, I'll never forget, the, the, the principal investigator of this incredible instrument kind of whined. I, I'm not saying all principal investigators whine or anything, but he kind of whined and said, I'm not going to get anything. If we don't get close enough to the comet, I'm going to get nothing. If I could just get one grain to be able to study, it would be good. OK, so he now has 12,000 samples. 
Um, and uh, this is just one example of the kind of plates that they get uh, covered with dust. And, and from that, they're going to try to sort out, you know, what is it made of? And what does that tell us about the, the cloud, the original cloud that we, out of which uh, comets and asteroids and planets formed? Okay, so that concludes my remarks. And I guess it's time for Dante DeLerta to come up. Thank you. I'm going to tell you about uh, a new journey that NASA is about to embark on. And I have the privilege of being the principal investigator uh, for the OSIRIS-REx mission. And I want to draw your attention to the little animation over here on the left. This is kind of where the mission culminates during its encounter with asteroid Bennu. We're going to take a perfectly good satellite and we're going to fly it right into the surface of the asteroid. It's going to make contact with basically an air filter for five seconds. We're going to blow down high pressure gas into the regolith or the loose soil on the surface of the asteroid. And it's basically a vacuum cleaner in reverse. Uh, there's a vacuum around the asteroid of outer space. We're bringing an atmosphere. We're going to create that vacuum cleaner action and we're going to suck up uh, tens or hundreds of grams of material off the surface of the asteroid and bring them back to the Earth for scientific analysis. So we're a sample return mission, as Jim alluded to at the opening remarks. The name of the mission is captured over here on the right, and each part of the acronym describes a key scientific objective. And I'll just start out by saying it's entirely my fault, the name of the mission. So when I was first brought on to the project, it was 2004. We were very early in the formulation stages and I was asked to be the deputy principal investigator by uh, my mentor, Mike Drake. And the first thing that he asked me to do was to define the science program for OSIRIS-REx. And I said, well, we gotta have a name. And so I sat down in the evening at home, my back patio in Tucson, Arizona, and I wrote down four words which kind of captured why you would wanna go to an asteroid and return a sample. And the first word I wrote down were origins. We're going back, just like dawn, to the earliest stages of the solar system. And we really wanna understand the chemical processes that led to the development of organic material and hydrated minerals, minerals that contain water in their crystal structure, and understand why is Earth a habitable environment and why did the origin of life occur here. And we believe these kinds of carbon-rich asteroids, like asteroid Bennu, that's our target, played a central role in delivering that material to the surface of the early Earth. The second thing I wrote down was spectroscopy because I came out of the meteorite uh, field. I had studied samples in the laboratory that we know come from these asteroids, and we were frustrated because we have a very difficult time figuring out which asteroids are delivering specific types of meteorite samples uh, to Earth. And we try to do this through spectral interpretation, where we look at the way light is reflected off the surface of an asteroid. We make measurements that simulate that in our laboratory, and we try to pair those up. And it's, it doesn't work that well, except in a few cases, like, for example, with asteroid Vesta and a group of meteorites called the HED meteorites. We wanted to get some material to ground truth, especially what is happening on these carbon-rich asteroid surfaces. The next thing I wrote down were resources. And I thought in 2004, this is really thinking futuristically. I'm, you know, I'm the forefront of sci-fi here. Someday we're going to go out, we're going to use these asteroids, we're going to get that water, we're going to get that organic material, we're going to build rocket fuel and life support systems, and we're going to further human exploration of the solar system. And when you look at what's happening now in industry and where NASA is going with the asteroid retrieval mission, they're starting to think seriously about can we process asteroidal material and use that to expand human presence in outer space. And then the last thing I wrote down was security. We do worry about the asteroid as an impact hazard. It's potentially the largest natural disaster facing humanity. It's also one that we can do something about with enough advance warning. And so we really want to understand how these asteroids move through the solar system. And it turns out a lot of the asteroids that represent an impact hazard to Earth are influenced not only by gravity, but by sunlight. They absorb light. They radiate it back out into space as heat. That acts as a thruster that pushes these things around and changes their orbits, and we call that the Arkovsky effect, and that's one of our key scientific investigations. So in the early days, uh, we were OSIRIS, and we proposed this. Uh, Alan mentioned the competition that you have to go through to win these missions. We proposed it in twice in the Discovery Program, which is where Dawn resides. Uh, and then it, we saw New Frontiers coming out, and it was a bigger mission. More, a bigger budget, we felt like we could um, overcome the weaknesses we were getting in our cost challenges. 
We wanted to keep the OSIRIS name because Jim and the team at NASA knew about us. They knew that we were working on this concept and were encouraging us to come back. But we wanted to be bigger, stronger, better than OSIRIS. And so a team member threw out OSIRIS Rex. And we all chuckled and thought that sounded pretty funny. And then we kind of took a moment and said, you know what, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, we like that. Let's go with it. And so I call this my backronym because then I needed to figure out a couple words to make it Osiris Rex. And I filled in the regolith explorer, regolith again being the material at the surface of the asteroid, and Osiris Rex was born. So here's our target asteroid. I want to start over here. The green circle, or the blue circle, is the orbit of the Earth, and the green circle is Bennu, which was called 1999 RQ36. And unlike what you saw in Mark's talk about main at belt asteroids, Bennu is a different type of asteroid. It's a near-Earth asteroid. And you can see right there, it does a very close approach to the Earth. That was its discovery apparition in 1999, uh, where it came about three times the distance uh, between the Earth and the Moon. And then the other thing I want to point out here, so this is in September. That's where the Earth is in September. And so now the Earth has gone another year around the Sun. But when the Earth gets back to that position, Bennu is now lagging behind by about one-sixth of the orbital um, path. And that means that Bennu is taking 1.2 years to go around the sun. Earth is taking one year to go around the sun. So it's only every six years that one of these close approaches take place. Bennu is, in fact, the most potentially hazardous asteroid that we know about. Uh, the good news is the odds of an impact are about one in 2,000. Uh, and you would cross the street with those odds. Most of us would, right? Um, and also, the impact, if it's going to occur, is about 150 years into the future. So I look at it as us as kind of a gift for the future. We're going to go characterize this object. We're going to understand its orbit very well. Uh, and we're going to determine how likely it is to impact the Earth and provide key information in the case a deflection mission is needed in the future. It's what's known as a near-Earth asteroid. And that's really what's required for a sample return mission. We couldn't really realistically get out to the main asteroid belt, get a sample, and bring it back to Earth on any kind of reasonable time frame. The other opportunity that this, these close approaches provide is that we can get phenomenal characterization of the target. And we had a great uh, set of radio science or radio astronomy. We used the Arecibo uh, radio telescope in Puerto Rico and also the Goldstone 70 meter dish. And I saw they had some really nice models of those out on the lawn today. To get these data that you see over here on the left, these are radar returns. And we're able to reach the absolute spatial resolution limit of Arecibo and Goldstone with the apparition in 1999 and six years later in 2005. And we take that information to reconstruct this detailed 3D geologic shape model of the asteroid. And this is incredibly valuable to us because now we can understand uh, how we're going to orbit this asteroid. We'll be the first mission to orbit such a small body. It's only 500 meters in diameter. It will be a pebble on the surface of Pluto or even on the surface of Ceres. Um, but this interesting nearly spherical shape with this equatorial ridge suggests that it's a rubble pile, that it's a loosely bound accumulation of gravel and boulders, which is good for our sampling system. Uh, and so there's a lot of interesting geology that we're going to learn about how these things behave in microgravity environments. And then finally, we know its rotation period. It takes about 4.3 hours to rotate. And it's uh, retrograde, which means its north pole is pointing down where the Earth's south pole would be. So it's opposite of uh, rotating in an opposite direction. But it's got almost um, perfect obliquity, so it has no seasonal effects. It doesn't really go through summer, winter, spring, and fall, which means the lighting will be constant while we're at, at Bennu. And we'll have plenty of good opportunities to characterize it in great detail and get all of the information that we need to decide where on the surface of the asteroid do we want to collect our sample from. So here's our timeline. Uh, we were selected back in May of 2011. And uh, it was a moment of great joy for us, but uh, also a great tragedy because our leader, Mike Drake, passed away four months after we won the contract and I was promoted up into the principal investigator role. And we make sure to remember his contribution. He was a great leader and a great friend. Uh, and so the mission is dedicated to him and his memory. Uh, we went through a series of reviews, reaching a critical point called confirmation. This is when I make my final deal with Jim. How much is this mission going to cost? And what is the science that we're going to deliver? And when is it all going to happen? Uh, and that went very smoothly. And we reached a very important milestone uh, just a, a couple months ago, where we passed what's called a system integration review. And we are now actively putting the spacecraft together and working towards our launch date in September of 2016. 
Uh, we also have to do an inclination plane change. Somebody was asking questions about inclination. Bennu is inclined about six degrees relative to the ecliptic or the orbital plane of the Earth. So we come back one year after launch and we do an Earth gravity assist, just like Dawn did a Mars gravity assist and uh, New Horizons did a Jupiter gravity assist. And we'll use that to do that inclination plane change and get us into the right angle of approach for Bennu. And we get to Bennu in August of 2018. We have a nice long encounter, so we actually cannot leave Bennu until March of 2021. Unlike Dawn, we are on a classic chemical propulsion system. So just like we have a launch window that opens up, we have a departure window for Bennu that opens up in March of 2021. We actually have a lot of flexibility, though. We could stay even into 2022, so we could extend the encounter if we needed to. Um, but we, we have about two and a half years here to study the asteroid and collect that sample from the surface. And then it's a two and a half year cruise home. So that's six year cadence. We have a close approach between Bennu and the Earth in 2017, and then another close approach between Bennu and the Earth in 2023. And that's when our samples get back as well. And then we have two years of support for sample analysis and curation. So the material will be distributed all around the world. Any qualified laboratory in any country can write to NASA requesting samples for study. And then the mission funding ends in September of 2025. But because it's a sample return mission, the sample analysis will continue for generations into the future. Even today, people are studying moon, moon rocks that were returned by the Apollo astronaut missions. It's really a phenomenal scientific resource to help us address these fundamental questions about our origins, about the spectral properties, about resources of near-Earth space, and about ways that um, asteroid regolith interacts with sunlight and potentially changes its orbit, leading to the Arakovsky effect. So here is the current state of the spacecraft. It's being assembled at the Lockheed Martin facility in Littleton, Colorado. Uh, it's a spacecraft open bus structure, very similar to the MAVEN Mars orbiter. Uh, in fact, it's the same team at Lockheed Martin that built MAVEN that is building OSIRIS-REx. Very capable and qualified group. Uh, these red covers are what we call remove before flight, things that have to come off before we go into space. And here's where a lot of our attitude control thrusters are. Our main engines are down at the bottom here. And uh, so the fuel tank is right in the center core cylinder. The science deck is this upper deck here where all the science instruments will be mounted along with that robotic arm sample collector and the sample return capsule. And in this image here, the technicians are installing the harness or the wiring that delivers power and data to all the different uh, elements of the spacecraft. We've actually gotten farther along in the development and all of our guidance, navigation, and control components are on the spacecraft. And we're currently installing all the telecommunication systems right now. So we're making great progress. The first instrument shows up in June and we'll start payload integration over the summer. And by early fall, the spacecraft will be built. We'll go into what's called system level environmental testing. And then we ship it down to Florida in May of 2016 to begin integration with the Atlas V uh, launch vehicle. So uh, there's a lot of exciting things coming. We are just at the very beginnings of our journey. And I invite you to join along with us. We have a great website at asteroidmission.org. I put about three articles a month up on my blog, so if you want to learn about the details of the science and the engineering, and then we're on all kinds of social media, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. So please uh, join us on this great journey and, and, and follow along with us. So uh, that's my spiel. I'm happy to introduce Carol Raymond, who will give you the latest results from the Dawn mission to Vesta and Ceres. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, really happy to be here and, and really happy to see all of you here to celebrate with us um, the, the journey that uh, we're culminating here um, as Dawn has arrived at Ceres. And uh, as Jim started out with, um, there's just a fantastic amount of um, activities going on at NASA studying small bodies, not only the spacecraft visiting them, but people doing uh, very complex models and, and analyzing samples that we have on Earth, the meteorite collection, as, as Dante was discussing, to, to really try to put all these pieces together um, and understand uh, a lot more about the early solar system, about um, how the Earth formed, where the water came from. So I'm gonna give you a really brief um, uh, overview of some of the science results that we've gotten from the Dawn mission, and, um, and then hopefully um, there'll be plenty of time for questions. 
So I'm going to jump right into asteroid Vesta, protoplanet Vesta. Um, as Mark started out explaining, uh, Vesta is the second most massive body in the main asteroid belt. And together, Vesta and Ceres constitute 40% of the mass of those uh, millions of objects that are in the main asteroid belt. So these are really fundamentally um, different kinds of, uh, of bodies than the collisional debris and the much smaller planetesimals. And as such, we can learn um, about the building blocks of the terrestrial planets and, um, and of the distribution of different kinds of material in the solar nebula by studying these bodies. So you're watching this animation of um, Vesta, and I thought it was going to loop again. So <laughs> if I'd known it wasn't, I would have explained some of the features you were seeing. Here we go. Thank you. Um, what we found when we got to Vesta is that it, it looked a lot like the class of meteorites that we um, knew had come from Vesta based on the, um, the association between the, the HED meteorites on the Earth and the telescopic spectra of Vesta. And that's shown in the fact that we have this, this blue material um, that you can see in the background. And, and also this light green material is, is the diogenite part of the HEDs. The, the blue material is more of the eucrite, the E, and the howardite is something in between. But what we found was how is that material distributed on the surface? You see that the, the diogenite, the greenish stuff, is, is largely in the southern hemisphere where we have a large impact crater that the blue um, is, is more concentrated in certain areas. And then we found these really odd kinds of materials, minerals on the surface, that, that are highlighted in these orangey colors. So we're, we're, we're seeing a very complex, geologically complex world, and one that we can pick apart based on looking at the morphology of the features, the mineralogy of the surface, and understanding from the gravity data that inside of Vesta there is a, a very um, dense uh, core, and we believe it's an iron core because we can account for the elements of the surface and comparing those with meteorites, we can really uh, understand how the whole body uh, formed. Now, um, this southern hemisphere of Vesta uh, has a l very large impact crater, and we've now been able to determine that the meteorite collection that we have on Earth is, is likely related to this last very large impact, which was so large, it, it nearly disrupted the body, and it caused the, these rings of troughs that are, um, that are basically around the edge of that impact crater. So we're also seeing the kinds of tectonic features on Vesta that we're familiar with from the Earth, and they're telling us something about how the body is, is put together in, in the interior, so we can follow um, the shock wave uh, transmission through the material and uh, figure out if we're seeing these kinds of, of features on the surface, what was the nature, the physical nature of that material inside the body. So we've, we've really done an in, incredibly thorough job of understanding asteroid Vesta, protoplanet Vesta, inside and out. And it's telling us that, indeed, it was a very, it formed very dry. It's um, almost the driest body in the solar system based on its initial, uh, the material that it, it, it had accreted from and the fact that it melted entirely internally, formed the iron core, formed a basaltic crust on the surface, and that um, uh, liberated many of the light volatile elements like carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. So we expected Vesta to be very dry. Now, um, this is the uh, southern hemisphere of Vesta, and that is the impact basin that I, I just talked about that liberated these, um, this material that we have now in our connect co collection as the HD meteorites. And um, actually, there was an even older, very large impact basin in the southern hemisphere beneath the Rhea Silvia, and that also created some, some of these trough features um, that we see in the northern hemisphere. Now, this basin is the one that Mark talked about as uh, it's a planetary scale impact. The central mound is two and a half times the height of Mount Everest. And if you um, scaled this to the Earth, this crater would extend from Tokyo over the North Pole to Washington, D.C. So this is, is really an, an incredibly um, profound feature to have been able to study on Vesta. 
Now, I'd really love to spend an hour talking about Vesta, but I have five minutes to talk about two um, really interesting bodies. So I'm going to take you on a little tour, point out some of the features um, that we see in one of the youngest impact craters on Vesta, the uh, crater called Marcia. And what we're seeing here um, is some layering in the crater wall. We have areas that are um, rougher, that look more like a competent rock material. And then we have areas that are very smooth and look like silt, kind of like a mud flat. And then down in the, in the center of the crater, we found a, a very interesting um, type of terrain, which we call pitted terrain. And if you've been to Yellowstone and seen the bubbling um, hydrothermal mud uh, pools, it, it resembles that in the sense that um, we believe that, that gases were coming from the subsurface that were erupting um, and leaving this rimless depression behind um, in, in, the, uh, in the crater ejecta. And that is evidence um, that there are volatiles on Vesta. There's, um, there's hydrogen, there's, there's light material that's being liberated from, probably from the rock, um, from hydrated uh, material um, in the rocks, and it's, it's coming through the, the ejecta and escaping into space. So this was one of our, our biggest uh, discoveries at Vesta, is that Vesta was not bone dry. And it was uh, backed up by our, our elemental mapping of hydrogen on the surface, where we found concentrations at four times the abundance one would expect if that hydrogen was coming in the solar wind. So clearly there's a source of hydrogen and likely a source of hydrated materials um, that's coming to Vesta from somewhere else. And we believe the somewhere else is the wetter, more primitive bodies of the outer solar system. And one of those bodies is Ceres. So we um, are studying Vesta and Ceres to try to understand the difference between these building blocks and how they um, interacted with their, their brethren to form our planets. A body like Vesta would have contributed iron um, and, and drier material, volatile poor material, but an object like Ceres would have contributed a lot of water. And this is um, the best guess we have at the current time as to what Ceres might look like. We have a dry, uh, dusty outer surface that's a result of the uh, ice having um, sublimated and left behind a lag deposit like when the ice melts uh, you know, on, the, on the streets of Washington, D.C., and at least behind that, that gross gunk. Um, that kind of stuff is likely on the surface, as well as all of this dust that's falling in, um, uh, like rainfall, onto the surface. Um, and then beneath that dusty surface, we believe there's a layer of dirty ice. So when Ceres originally formed, it was made of chondritic material from the solar nebula. It heated up some but it didn't heat up hot enough to boil off the volatiles, to segregate the iron into a core, and form a really rocky planet like Vesta is. So instead, it likely has a fairly iron-rich dehydrated silicate core, central core, and then a large hydrated silicate uh, mantle. So this is just a rock that has a lot of water, and that would be like clay. So we have kind of, it's like a mud planet. Um, this, is, this is more like a rock, but it's a rock that contains a lot of water. And at the, in, in the past, when there was more uh, radioactive material that was emitting heat, um, Ceres would have been warmer, and that uh, ice that you see would have been liquid for some period of time. So in the past, we had um, basically a, a, a subsurface ocean. We had a seafloor where it was warm, and we had a lot of processes going on that are similar. To, um, to hydrothermal processes on our ocean floor, and we know those are environments for life. So we're really interested to know more about the environment um, within this icy, rocky um, subsurface of Ceres, and we're gonna do that by reading the record that's left on the surface. So our, our gravity data are gonna tell us a little bit about this, how the different materials are distributed in the interior, but really we have to look at the, what's left on the surface, the flows of material that's come up from below, the types of minerals and their distribution and the tectonic features, the cracks, the craters, and the lumps and bumps to try to uh, work back to what was going on in the interior as this body was evolving. 
Um, so I think uh, I have two more slides. And this is a uh, mosaic that's made from that rotating globe that you've seen now a couple times. And the, the star of the show are the, these bright spots in a large crater in the northern hemisphere. And um, we don't yet know what those bright spots are, but I can tell you they are very bright, very reflective, and their, their reflectivity, their albedo, is more similar to something that's icy or salts. So those are um, some of the leading hypotheses for what those, um, what those bright spots are. And you can see that they exist in other areas as well, but these other spots are not nearly as bright as this central um, spot in that, in that crater. But I'll point out um, that there are a couple other really intriguing things about the surface of Ceres. And one is that there, some areas appear much smoother than others. Like this one is, is, um, has more craters. It has more uh, distinct craters. And then we have this very large basin, which is, appears relaxed, if it, like it's, it's been flowing over time, and, and its topography has been reduced. And we see that also over here. And then the other thing is there's a lot of things that are not craters, which um, don't, don't pay attention to the striping. That's the artifacts of the mosaicing. But you see a lot of features which look linear, and they sometimes come out of craters. And those features are the ones that are going to really help us to read back what's the strength of the material, what's going on beneath the surface, and how is the surface and subsurface interacted over time. So these are some of the things we're looking forward to um, doing with the data that we're um, getting from Ceres. So uh, finally, I just want to leave you with the thought. I've been telling you about warm uh, ocean, subsurface ocean on Ceres. Ceres is much closer to the sun. It's much warmer than the icy moons of the outer solar system. But both um, Europa, shown here, and these are all to scale, Europa and, and Enceladus, and Ceres all have very similar compositions, similar uh, geological evolutions. And thus, um, we know that Enceladus has, at present, a subsurface ocean, maybe not global, um, and it's emitting um, plumes uh, out of the subsurface that have been measured. We also um, uh, are, uh, know that Europa um, has a subsurface ocean based on magnetic field data, and we're hoping that the sp spacecraft is going to go there, really investigate this in detail, and tell us a lot more about the habitability of Europa. So, um, so we're, we're trying to put all of this together and understand what were the habitable environments um, in our solar system, and how um, did objects like Ceres um, bring water, volatiles, and potentially life to the inner solar system to, um, to combine with the drier, rockier material as represented by Vesta to create this diversity that we now see. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it back over to Emily, and we'll get started with the panel discussion. Thank you.